Hello, everybody. Welcome to this very first meeting, first virtual meeting of the Milpitas Historical Society. It's actually not an official meeting, but kind of our training wheels, we're calling it, to uh, run meetings online. And we will do a presentation, of course. Um, I'm Bill Hare. I am the president of the Milpitas Historical Society. Please let us know you are here in the chat down below. Um, you can just, and, and let us know when you lived in Milpitas or if you still live in Milpitas. And if not, where you live now. I wanna see where everybody got, everybody got spread out to. Uh, so just, yeah, just let us know down in the chat. Uh, the little uh, thing about us, the society was formed in 1980 by Milpitas Post co-publisher Elaine Levine, along with uh, longtime historian Pat Loomis, Parks and Rec director Bob McGuire, school superintendent Leo Murphy, and librarian Ed Cavallini. So this is our 40th year, and uh, we're pretty proud of our website, and our speaker today, Joe, has a lot to do with this. Uh, if you want to go uh, check out after this, uh, go to milpitashistoricalsociety.org. All one word, milpitashistoricalsociety.org. And there is a lot of really cool content uh, that we've been putting up. And um, you, can, you can learn about your old school, your old street name, uh, the history behind those names, uh, and uh, lots of other cool little tidbits. Uh, you may also remember that we had a display in the food court entrance to the Great Mall. Um, if, if you were in the Great Mall sometime during the last 20 years. Unfortunately, last year we were kicked out of there uh, to make room for the new Legoland installation. And all of our thousands of historical items have since been, you know, have been in storage since then. So one of our goals of the society since its founding in 1980 has been to have a dedicated museum in town, Milpitas being one of the very last cities uh, in the Bay Area to not have a museum. So uh, eight years ago, we formed another nonprofit, the Milpitas Community Museum in order to focus on that task. And I actually hold two positions on that board as secretary from the very beginning and for the last three years, as president of the Milpitas Historical Society, since there's an automatic board seat for whoever is the president at that moment. So um, the two organizations would obviously work hand in hand on this project, uh, but um, you know, we, we can really use as much community support as we can get um, you know, both, both organizations in terms of getting a museum. So uh, mainly, you know, if you can write a letter, let, let, let our city council know that it's about time for a permanent museum in the city. We'd appreciate that. And uh, I think we're gonna, I think we're going to build something pretty good. We have a nice collection. We, we are uh, actually putting together a lot of really interesting uh, video content, which of course Joe is doing. And you'll hear from him in just a minute. But um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, let us know you're here and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Okay. Um, I put this presentation. I've been I've put together a number of presentations in the past. Uh, one of the reasons for them, some of those presentations were for our general meetings of the historical society. Uh, if it was something of interest that I could talk about, and then the other. Um, activity that I've been involved with, with Craig Bunnell, who's uh, about a year or so ago, maybe, actually maybe about a year and a half ago, moved to Florida. So I've kind of taken over uh, what we used to work as a team. It's called the Educational Outreach Program, where I go into elementary schools and do Milpitas history with them. So I've kind of been involved in doing this. This presentation that I'm doing today, uh, this is for you. And this is so it's the first time this one's been shown. And the key concept that I built this around is the notion that um, I'm gonna show you some things that exist now, and I'm gonna kind of fade back into time to show you what was there before what you see today if you were to drive down Main Street. So I'm gonna give a brief overview. It'll give you a sense of what's happened in the development of the city. Um, and you know, using aerial photography, and this is an, this is basically a pretty recent 
photograph of what Milpitas looks like. And this is actually even only part of Milpitas, but this is kind of the southern edge that you're seeing right down in the center there. It, there's a tag, a red tag that says the Great Mall. Uh, I'll show you what was there soon, but the, kind of the, the, the white roofed buildings, you can pretty much think of that as commercial development. And the smaller dots that you see, you know, so profusely on the screen, those are those are residences, you know. And if you're curious, okay, so so this is kind of today. This is what Milpitas looks like today. And this is what it looked like when Ford came to town. And actually, what the mall is is a, if you will, a renovation, an alteration and renovation of this Ford plant. The Ford plant came in 1955 and operated until 1983, uh, building all kinds of vehicles, uh, cars, trucks, uh, of all various Ford motor makes. But you can see that there was, uh, at the, in 1955, which is what, uh, 45, 65 years ago, what we were looking at essentially was, you can see there's a lot of agricultural land or basically uh, un, you know, essentially unused, which you would think it was unused land, but it's basically agricultural and ranching. So Ford appearance basically shifted Milpitas, began the shift from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. But so this is what, this is what it looked like before Ford showed up. And I'm gonna use my cursor. This zone down here, actually this, line off, you know, working. That's where now in South Milpitas, where my cursor is, is essentially the intersection of Main Street and Capitol. Um, in the old days, this would have been the Oakland Highway. And before that, it would have been called the Mission Road. And, um, and so anyways, this veering off here to the right, that's Capitol. And this, now I'm tracing out, that's Land S. This is the Great Mall. This is the Ford plant that preceded it. Uh, something that's uh, kind of uh, and, and interesting, and it's kind of a white zone here. I'll use a different thing right there. That's actually the, the John Sinnott farm. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on individual people, but he's kind of interesting. He was an early, actually a pretty early migrant to Milpitas uh, from, from Ireland. And he came actually with the Murphys. If you're familiar with the Murphys, they were huge. Uh, Murphy Jr., Martin Murphy Jr. was the founder of Sunnyvale. His father had ranch, a rancho to the, basically more toward Morgan Hill Gilroy and um, Martin Murphy Jr.'s brothers and everything. Turns out John Sinnott came with the Murphy family uh, from Ireland to Canada. And then the Murphys left Canada sooner than, than John Sinnott, but John Sinnott followed and this winds up being his ranch. And today we have a school named for John Sinnott. This is uh, looking at um, basically downtown and Milpitas from the opposite direction. This is up in the North, much basically up toward the Sunny Hills area. Um, but this is, this is, this is downtown, it's 1947. So we're just a few years after the war and here's, here's Main Street and here's that veering off of Capitol and Landis would be going out that way. And San Jose, part of San Jose you're seeing up at the top of the screen, uh, but it's very agricultural. This is zoomed in and this is, this is also a 1947 map, but to give you an idea of what I'm going to be talking about, um, there are going to be a couple of key buildings. This building that's I'm going to show you, that's the grammar school. This is an important building across the street from it. The building right next to the grammar school, that's important. I'm going to focus around this agent. This is Calaveras Road. Okay, In those days, it would have been called Calaveras Road. This is Main Street. In those days, it also would have been known as the Oakland Highway. And this road off to the right here, that's the Alviso Milpitas Road. Um, and so this is Main Street on the way towards San Jose. Well, before you, before township, in other words, the town was basically uh, founded as a township right after the um, 
the gold rush. So Milpitas, you know, you could say early 1850s, 1854 is one of the dates that we tend to think of. And um, but they came in to the land that was Milpitas Rancho. I'm not going to talk a lot about the ranchos today because that's actually a separate presentation that I should make that gives the Spanish Mexican heritage of Milpitas. But I'll, I will say that the following thing: the, the Spaniards came from Mexico up into Alta, what they call, refer to as Alta California, which is more than just Northern California. It, it represented about six states. It was a very large thing. It was, but they came up to Monterey and into the Bay Area, and they settled. San Jose was uh, the Pueblo de San Jose was formed in in the you know, late late 1700s, and the ranchos started getting created in the early 1800s. The church really had most of the land uh, in the early stages of the, of the uh, colonization of California. But the key is, this is, if you get before 1850, what you're really going to get is just um, open ranch land for the most part, you're not really into orchards or anything. They were basically raising cattle and selling um, selling cattle, raising cattle for hides. Hides were making leather and they were exporting that by ship um, to uh, the East Coast and things like that and tallow. But so eight, before 1850, in effect, what you really had was just wild ranch lands. The part that I find fascinating is, is this is the same, the picture on the left is the same picture I'm just showing you, but Watch what happens. This picture is just around the corner from my house. I took it about a year and a half ago. Ranching still exists today in Milpitas, particularly extended Milpitas. Uh, this is basically up on Piedmont Road. So, the, so if you're in town and you look to the east at the foothills, uh, that's where I'm at in this particular video. I'm at the bottom of the foothills. This is this was the uh, once a year annual branding where they're branding all the cattle. Uh, that's actually a requirement um, that they brand individual cows, you know. Um, and, but if you were to go over into where the reservoir is, that was in my the backdrop one of my screen. Um, that that is still you know, active ranch land and as is this. In other words, the eastern slopes, I, I look out of my house, if you will, or if I go out into the street and I'm looking up onto these eastern slopes and, you know, this is, this is ranch land for me. Um, and they still do what they did 200 years ago. Okay, so again, so kind of the last overview, you can see the, the, the heart of uh, downtown Milpitas in 1840, in 1947, and this is this again. This is the Alviso Milpitas Road. This is Main Street, the Oakland Highway. This is Calaveras Road. This is the this is Calaveras Road. And actually, it, it looks a lot like that today. But one of the things that is kind of interesting is that if you were to to go into an earlier photograph, it didn't actually go up into the hills the way it does now. It actually curved over and actually maybe from about that location. That location, by the way, if you're curious, is about where the Samuel Air House is and where the high school um, was. But and this is old Calaveras over here. And so that actually used to go, that's the old way up into the hills and the Spring Valley up in here. And then it would wander, wander around and up into the Calaveras Valley. But that's, the, the key is that's, that's really what Milpitas was like right after World War II. This is a reminder, this is how concentrated and dense it is today. And right down, right down here, that's the Great Mall, that's the Ford plant. Uh, but as soon as you get prior to the Ford plant, all of this stuff disappears. Uh, you know, literally all of it disappears except the occasional dot of a house for that represented a farmhouse or a ranch house. Okay, so let's let's start walking our way through Main Street. Uh, it's a reminder of what the growth of population looks like. Um, 
1950, we, Milpitas Incorporated transitioned from a township to a, to a, to a city uh, in 1954. But so basically in that era, we were 500 to maybe, maybe 800 people. Typically there would be seasonal influxes during the agricultural harvesting, you know, canning, canning, picking crop and canning things. But you'll notice from with, after the arrival of Ford, you know, we go for, from 1950, we go from 500 to 6,500. That's a huge multiplier to happen in a single decade. There's a, the next big as a multiplier, of course, is 1960 to 1970. In other words, this industrial, the appearance of this transition to the beginnings of the industrial ocean forward manufacturing, that's, that, that was still pushing population very rapidly. If we had a, like another fourfold increase on top of the 1960 by 1970, so in one decade, fourfold increase over the prior decade. And we still grow, um, but it doesn't necessarily grow at the same, you know, fantastic rates of percentage. But it's still, you know, pretty clearly we've gone from five in seventy years we've gone from about five hundred population to eighty thousand. So it's pretty big now. As far as the the local other cities in the Bay Area, we're not really huge at eighty thousand. But the point is, is that we've grown a lot. This is uh, Main Street in. 1967, and there's a couple of things that I'm going to have you, I'm going to point out to you in 1967 um, that we'll actually look at specifically. Um, this is going to be an important thing. That's the St. John, you know, Baptist Catholic Church. Uh, this, the, this is zone right in here. There's, there's an awful lot of great interest. This is the Milpinas Alvisa Road here. This is the Oakland Highway, our main street going up. Um, but I mean, there's going to be a lot of focus in just this zone for tonight's presentation or this afternoon's presentation. Okay, this, this is north. This is, you know, probably anybody that's still living here, um, you'd recognize this. This is our current library. Uh, some of you who uh, will see this either now or later on a delayed basis uh, on YouTube. Um, this is the, the library that was built in 2009, but it, what's interesting about it is you'll, you'll find out. And by the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, I'm going to take you to a modern location and then you know, kind of slide you back in time. But this is the north wing of the library. It's the children's wing, and the second floor is also an extension of the book collections. And I also have computer terminals for people to use on a public basis. This core structure here, you know, architecturally, it's neoclassical. It you know, doesn't necessarily look like a modern library, and there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Off to the right, that's the south wing of the new library, and the big concrete structure behind here is the garage to service the library. But this core building, this you know, gorgeous neoclassical building, it was opened in 1916. And this is what it looked like when it was a grammar school and didn't have the library embedded around it. I, I, I love the idea that, that they actually, uh, rather than destroy this building, um, they basically repurposed it, they renovated it, if you will, they you know, changed things in terms of its you know, internal structure to some degree. But the bottom line is, is that they you know, basically absorbed it into the design of the new library. And so we still have this historic structure um, that hasn't been destroyed. And that's usually one of two things happens when you really get down to it. We either uh, restore something to its original condition or we renovate it, by, by which I mean, we maybe keep the structure, but somehow make some modifications, perhaps internally, to facilitate a completely different use from the original, from the original, uh, original use, or redevelopment, which is when you basically level it and put it something radically different in the same place. So there's several things there to keep in mind as I walk us down Main Street as to whether something's been basically destroyed or whether something's actually been uh, kept in some fashion or other, but this this particular uh, grammar school, um, perhaps what's significant in terms of the title, 
I'll explain the 1916 in a minute in terms of its opening date, because again, Milpitas Township was more like 1854 in terms of its origin. It closed in 1956. Well, the reason why it closed, and you'll see this illustrated in a minute, was that basically it's suddenly with Ford, as Ford uh, starts bringing lots of people in, the, the, the plant was actually built here, was shifting production from basically the Oakland, the Oakland area to here. And so a lot of families needed to move in. Uh, you know, they had 5,000 employees uh, on the order of 5,000 employees in its peak. 19, so 1956, where the city, um, we're now two years into a city uh, status, uh, we're, there's a lot of pressure in terms of families, in terms of schools. And, we, and so the old school that I just showed you, um, it was replaced by the first two schools that you see here. And in 1956, they were called Sunny Hills and Milpitas Manor. The third school, the elementary school, which opened uh, three years later, it was basically um, came into being as it were in terms of planning and construction. It, its targeted name was Milford Village. Milford's um, basically a short form for Milpitas Ford. Um, but it, they decided at, at by an, on the opening, during the opening of the Alexander Rose School, they adopted a completely different strategy about naming schools. And they went from locale or the, 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 the region within the city that these schools existed to naming them for basically uh, people that had some role in the city itself. So Joseph Weller was an important pioneer. And so Sunny Hills became Joseph Weller, Anthony Spangler. You'll 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 see a bit more about him in a minute. Um, uh, so that Milpitas Manor was renamed Spangler, and so on. And so now it's pretty much renamed for people, and not locales within the city. By the way, Joseph Weller was the one who donated the land for the uh, for the original schools, and not not not, the, the, not this school. This is a modern school, but. In this school. This is on Weller land. And this is the first, yeah, what I would say is the in-town school. We had we had some elementary schools up in the hills, up where Bill lives. Airpoint was up there, Laguna in the school was up there. So Laguna school is on Bill's property, uh, so it still exists. And there was a Calavera school over, which is, I, by my sense of things, is probably somewhere underneath the water of the Calaveras Reservoir. But so there were there were some elementary schools up in the hills because it was a, would have been a long haul for people to come out of the hills down to town. But, but so the, this, these two schools, and actually the, the started out as a single school, the one on the left. Um, and then as the size of the population of the town grew, they built the the second structure on the right and the one on the left became the lower grades of school. And the one on the right was where the um, slightly older children went. And what happened by the way with those two schools is they were basically severely damaged in a fire and they built a temporary structure and the replacement to them was the grammar school that I started with, the one where the library it has been embedded into the library. That was the replacement to the those two buildings that I was just showing you. Directly across the street from the library is the Rensselaer Smith House. Um, he was the second physician in Milpitas, so he was in he was in kind of one of the early people. This particular house was built. As a matter of fact, it coincided in time with the construction of the grammar school that's in the library. Um, they both were built in 19, basically 1915, 1916. They were designed by the same architect, uh, Frank Delos Wolf. The, there was an intention to make the school neoclassical architecture, but there was also an intention in this case, this is called prairie, prairie style architecture, which Frank Lloyd Wright really popularized. But so basically the same architect built these two structures, one across the street from the other. Now, this is where you would find this house today if you were to go down to the library of Main Street and take a look at it. But this is where it used to be, and I'll give you a little bit more of that, but it used to be set back from the street when it was originally built. And um, there's, 
I don't have an outstanding way. There's, we don't have any, you know, like interesting clues of, of uh, somebody standing in the driveway here with a certain kind of clothing or a car that might, you know, whose ear might date it. But the trees that you see um, by the building, they actually help me. I would suggest this particular photograph is probably about 1970, maybe 75, and I'll explain that when I show you this. But again, it was built in 19, 1916. Okay, so this, this is Main Street in 1947 photograph. It's just, I'm zoomed in, I showed you a, 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 a more pulled back version of this. That's the grammar school. This is where the library has, you know, basically been built around it. Right across the street, that's the DeVries house. And you can see the arching driveway. But if you look really carefully, you'll notice that the trees are younger, smaller, right? And so what I'm doing when I say that this house in that previous photograph, this might, that photograph might be about 1970, 75, somewhere in there. I'm basically trying to adjust for, account for the growth in the trees for this house. But like I say, the city basically moved this house down to the street and then they put senior housing in behind it. Uh, other things that are interesting in this is I'm going to talk about this building, the building right next to the library. You'll hear me talk about that. I'm going to talk about buildings in here. I'm going to talk about buildings in this whole zone quite a bit and also up here. But anyway, so to give you a sense of things. Oh, and by the way, it's just for information right now, the dividing line between North you know, Main Street and South Main Street, it's Calaveras Road. So anything to the north, and the north is to the bottom here. Um, that would be North Mill, North Main Street, and everything from that location there to to going towards San Jose. That's going south. That's South Main Street. Okay. So just a reminder, I wanted to get your the, the photograph on the right is the key photograph, but I'm giving you bearings because this is what the right wing, the south wing of the the library looks like so i'm putting up the old photograph to to help you uh, orient yourself what's interesting about this location is that it used to be remember i said there's a structure next to the library that I, or next to the grammar school that i wanted to show you it's this structure and it's this is one of one of a number of blacksmith shops that we had in milpitas this one dates back to the 1920s and actually one of the descendants uh, lives in San Jose and is a member of the Historical Society and he's, he's alive and we see him every once in a while. Uh, this is the Windsor Blacksmith Shop. Um, this building is what it looked like, that's what it looked like in 1922. And those are his, his relatives and something that I know of um, that's um, and I don't actually have a discrete photograph of, but I know that the location, but this is, so this is, again, this is the blacksmith shop. If you look over to where my cursor is, you kind of see a bay window here and you see a different kind of roof. That's actually the house. That's the Windsor house. Um, and so officially it's over on the street behind Main Street, uh, which is Windsor Street, right? And if you, and if you actually were to drive uh, from Calaveras on Windsor Street, to the north, one block or so, you actually enter the library garage. But these are the Windsors. Um, now, what's kind of interesting about this, some of this, uh, it's, yeah, I don't know how much you can see, but for example, th this, this is a test wall. That, as a blacksmith shop, they repaired uh, anything with iron, iron straps, wagons, you know, maybe rims around wagon wheels horseshoes, um, uh, they could manufacture farm implements, they could repair you know, iron uh, implements and so on, but they made brands, cattle brands, and I was showing you about the ranching that even actually still exists today. Well, ranching was certainly big 100 years ago, because uh, 100 years ago, we didn't have a township uh, for well, barely. Yeah, well, we did, but it was, it was still a very small township, really, because uh, I don't even have a photograph to show you of of the, I don't have an aerial photograph or anything like that to show you what Milpitas would have looked like in the 1920s. But there's, there are, there are brands on this board, on this board, on this board, on this board, 
this these two boards look like replacement boards to me there must somebody maybe got busted or something there's brands here brands here brands here brands here well what's kind of interesting about this is not only did the library um integrate the grammar school into its structure but it did one other thing that's kind of fascinating and the location of this wall approximates the location of this wall, which is a display within the garage of the library. And so you can actually see, and now these are quite easy to see because they've in effect blackened the, the uh, bands to make them easy to see. They, these were, the, if these were burn marks, they would, they would heat up a new branding iron that they're going to deliver to one of the ranchers and they'd press it into the board and what they were looking for was uniformity. They wanted to make sure that the brand was good and flat so that they had a good uniform brand. And that's the brand that would appear on the, the cattle. And you can go see this if you're in the garage uh, uh, in the library. This corner, this corner is a big corner because actually off to the left, you don't see a street in either case, but over to, veering to the left would be Calaveras Road. Um, this is before the Calaveras overpass it was built in 1970. Uh, and then over on, on at the right frame of the picture, going vertically, if you will, going up, that, that would have been Main Street. Well, so this is the corner of Main Street. And today it's called Carlos because Calaveras has been rerouted. Well, one of the things that was there before this Buddhist temple was A.N.W. Rupier and anybody that went to school here in like high school in the 50s or 60s or whatever they would have known about A.N.W. Rupier. There's a lot of people on uh, I love old Milpitas, old, old school Milpitas that uh, will talk you know very fondly about the days when they would go to A.N.W. Rupier. But it's an aerial photograph and it's actually about the same time period and this is A&W roof here and right there, and you can actually see the striping of the roof line. So, you know, I mean, I, that, that to me, it's, I'm absolutely certain that's A&W roof here. This is the gas station across the street. We'll get in, into that in a minute. This is the, the Krusich building. Um, we'll get into that. Actually, this, this over here was, um, uh, I think that was the, the uh, Peshot house in the early days, or maybe it was the Krakalisi house in the, in the early days, but we'll get into that a little bit more. But this, this gives an over, and this actually shows, this is Calaveras right here. And this is the days when it was a street grade crossing, which was a big problem because if, uh, when, when the trains were switching in the Ford era, which would be any time after 1955, when the trains were switching back and forth and so on and so forth, they could basically shut down this road for a while and it would actually really stack up with traffic and since our fire stations were mostly over here on the main street side of things it had a they'd have a lot of trouble getting uh, to a fire on the east east part of town uh, because of that so that's that was the reason for building the overpass in 1970 same corner this is main street looking to the south uh, the street that's turning to the left here that's calaveras road uh, same same gas station, it's a shell station. In that previous aerial photograph, it was a shell station, but the building is completely different. So in other words, this building had been torn down between 54 and, and the 1960s. It had been torn down, basically rebuilt again. Uh, across the street from it, where a and you know, would have been uh, prior to this in the 60s, 70s, that kind of time frame, was a grocery market, Pop Mills. And if I push earlier back in time, don't have a photograph that I can show you today, but it was an Amaryl store. So the, the Amaryl store became the Pop Mills store, which became A&W. But, uh, and I remember I mentioned uh, school number two was Spangler and school number three elementary school in terms of the new schools was uh, Alexander Rose. Well, it's named after the, the guys that were operating that station there on the left. Now, this is uh, our Kentucky Fried Chicken and a little bit of a strip mall area here. And you wouldn't 
you wouldn't think uh, you would it gives you no clue as to what would have been there before but what was there before in the old days 100 years ago was a veterinary hospital where if you if you had if you had injured animals particularly large animals um, like horses and and so on if if they were sick you know they could they could bring them to dr boyd uh, and uh, he could stable them here and, and heal them. And maybe they'd gotten a cut or maybe they'd been attacked by wild animals or something like that. And this is where you'd have to take your livestock if uh, you were trying to save them. Just a little bit south of that location, same side of the street, we're looking at the west side of west, we're looking westward, if you will, of uh, on Main, Main Street. That's today, for anybody that uh, still lives here, that's the Anjan building. And depending upon when you left Milpitas, um, you would have known it by some other names that I'm going to show you. But that this is, this is, buildings still exist today. It's a modern photograph. You know, I took that photograph. So somebody that was went to school, you know, maybe several decades back or so, they would have known it as the Krakalisi building. And the number of things is that you can see there's facade, some facade changes here. The windows, when there's window coverings now that uh, there weren't before. But anyway, and then there's a hard hardware that was attached to it. There's, there's these, this whole storefront area sometimes had different roles, but, um, but it was still the Krakalisi enterprise, if you will, over the years. This is the same building and uh, this shows it, for example, as a hardware store and as a drug store and a veterinary supply off just to the left behind that pole. Um, but this is moving into the uh, 1950s. Now, something I want to draw your attention to is the coverings across the windows on front. They're not there in earlier and say in the 50s, and, but we still have the, 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 the kind of the flat roof line way at the top. So, so those panels in the previous photograph are things that have been added uh, in time. And then the other thing that uh, Bill and I were talking about privately was, is that you'll notice that the street is, is a down uh, from the, you have to climb the curb, if you will, three-step curb to get up to the street level. But that's not the case anymore. It's been built up a lot with asphalt and things like that. This is, I put this photograph in for two reasons. One is, this is out of a 1953 newspaper, which explains this, what's called a halftone, uh, which is what newspapers do to try and prevent too much black ink from saturating the newsprint. They'll do a halftone process that creates these dots. Um, what you'll notice is, first of all, the windows are uncovered. All the windows are uncovered. There are no panels covering anything. Uh, and you'll also notice there's up at the top of the roof line, you'll notice there's a corner up there that's uh, a rising corner. I'll talk about that more in a second, but that's significant because this suggests that after this photograph in 1953, that, that false front had been modified that I showed you in the previous photograph. The second thing is this would have been, this is a very early post office in Milpitas history. Um, I moved to Milpitas in 1967. This post office was no longer used. There was actually a post office that's uh, currently on Carlo. It would have been on Calab it was Calaveras Road then. Basically, Calaveras and Windsor was where the post office was, was when I came here. And today, it's over on Abel, so it's in a third location. But the key is, look at that upper left corner, the building. And what that is, is that's the original. So in 1953, we had the original false front. And this building is the Bichotte General Store. And the upper floor was a social, it's a Maple Hall. And it was basically a social activity uh, when you needed a big, when you needed a large space for a community gathering, an indoor space, like maybe for indoor dancing and things like that. Maple Hall was the, was the place to, uh, to go and that's what it was back then. And over to the left, this is this building, you know, again, it, it, it left its scene for a while, but this was the Frank Terra structure. He was one of the early Milpitas Peixotes were, they were early too. 
um, for sure it's Portuguese. Uh, the building on the left, by the way, it had a variety of different businesses over time it, in this particular, uh, this is a postcard. I should, I should note that this is a postcard that was um, a, one of a series of postcards that had been created by the founder of the Bank of Milpitas. And I'll, I'll, take you, I'll be showing you that in a minute, but this was his way of uh, handing out postcards to customers and promoting Milpitas and business. If you turn around and look to the to the east, we were looking to the, to the west there. If we turn around and look to the east, what we have now is this chain link fence. And what we're what we're starting to see is this is very recent within the last few weeks. We're starting to see some construction, which is an extension of this little small strip mall area. But this lot used to be hold this, it was Cozy Kitchen. And Cozy Kitchen was, was uh, created just after World War II. Uh, was it out, uh, Alexander Carlo and, and uh, Josephine Simus, that was the husband and wife. They, uh, they founded this, this business. And this was an institution, this is right on Main Street. This was a big institution. I used to, uh, when I first moved into Milpitas in 67, I used to live up in the northern part of Milpitas on Kurtner Drive, and that's another, you know, big historical name in terms of pioneers in Milpitas. But I used to live up on Kurtner Drive, and I used to drive. You know, there was at that point, um, uh, I used to have to come down Main Street, the old route. But anyway, I used to have to come down Main Street to catch 237 and go across the bay because I was on my way to Mendel Park to go to Stanford Research Institute. I used to go driving by this place, but at that point, I mean, I was on the way to work. I'd had breakfast at home or whatever. So I've lived in Milpitas for like 52 years and I never ate in that restaurant, which is, sounds pretty weird to me today, but that's the actual fact of things. But it was a pretty big uh, institution. It was immortalized in a sense in uh, the movie that Bob Burrell and uh, students in, at Iowa High School made a movie called The Milpitas Monster. Uh, they're, they're, I'm certain that there are people who might be watching you know, my presentation that have seen the movie at least once. It's a replica of the cozy kitchen that they used as a, as a prop in order to film the movie. But that's how, you know, kind of much of an icon of Main Street Milpitas uh, the restaurant was. It actually made its way into the movie. Uh, this, What's interesting, I'm gonna back up just quickly. You'll notice that the false front is square across the top. Okay, now this, the, this photograph was published in a newspaper called the Milpita Star, which was basically in competition with the beginning, the startup of the, uh, the Milpitas Post. But the photograph, because I actually have the newspaper, it's in our archives. And I looked at the photo, the original photograph in the newspaper, and what you couldn't actually see was the, the, the superstructure, if you will, the false front of the building. Bob Burrell, this photograph appears in Bob Burrell's book, uh, Images of America, Milpitas. And what he did is he outlined in, he drew in, if you will, uh, the, the structure. So in the beginning of the cozy kitchen, it had a structure like this. In other words, this is the same architectural style that we saw in the Peixota building. And this was also a Peixota business, well, you know, one across the street and the other. This was a market. And in particular, it was in some cases, it was a meat market. But, uh, but now you see that older, that older style architecture. And it's kind of a fascinating picture of, of Milpitas. Um, you know, it, it actually looks like it, the car, if you were to pull the car out of there, you would think it's kind of a, a, a Western town. Uh, if you take the car out and if you take the telephone, the telephone pole out with all the telephone lines, it would look very Western, old Western. Okay, this, this photograph, uh, it's one of my photographs. Um, I, I, kind of tried to uh, take this really intentionally, but you can see off to the right, 
is that's the Anjan building for the, the old Peugeot thing. This is the, um, the Main Street Professional Center now. It's an office complex. I'm going to show you what happened to that corner. Very important corner because, again, this is the Oakland Highway slash Main Street. This over off to the left, that's the mountain, uh, the Yale Viso Milpitas Road. And actually from El, from El Viso going to the west, it was the El Viso Mountain View Road. So you can really kind of say it's the Mountain View to El Viso to Milpitas Road. So a hugely important intersection. Uh, we basically, you had a north-south intersecting with an east-west, and that was really important for commerce and everything. But, but there's three significant locations here. This one here, the southeast corner, that's the north, the northeast corner, right? These three buildings, pretty, pretty important. I'm going to explore this building in the center with you. It was preceded uh, by the Fat Boy Barbecue Restaurant, which actually was an early day. It was an innovation in its, in its time, 1920s. Uh, it was a fast food restaurant in effect, you know. Um, and, you know, later on, you know, like I say, in, in, the, uh, in the 40s up into the 1990s, um, we had Cozy Kitchen, which was just a half a block away. But this is right here on the, the corner. And what makes the corner an even bigger deal, but this was a big deal, by the way, for actually for people who were driving, say, from San Jose to Oakland down the, the Oakland Highway here, this might very well be a place that they would, particularly in the 1920s, 1930s, early 40s, this would be the place that they would, so any time before the war, if you will, between 24 and World War II, uh, this would be one of the places that they could stop to eat. Well, this is an older photograph, but it's really cool in a variety of ways. Um, so again, so there's the Peugeot building right in the center with that big high arch and so on. And there's the Frank Terra building next to it. Well, this was the Fat Boy location and that's the Milpitas Hotel. This picture was probably sometime in the 19. Well, it, it, it would be after 1910, and I'll explain that in a minute, okay? But, but, but and then this is this southeastern location, and that's gonna be significant, but this is gonna, this, look, just try and remember the structure, the roof line of that particular building, because that building is going to, is preceding some other buildings that I'm gonna show you. But that's the Milpitas Hotel which by the way, originally uh, it opened in, in like the 1850s. It's gone through a variety of names, um, Milpitas Hotel at this point. Prior to that, it was uh, Alfred French's Hotel, French's Hotel and, and so on. So it had some slightly earlier names, but the key is Al Alfred French, French Hotel and Milpitas Inn and Milpitas Hotel. Those are the really significant long-term proprietorships of that particular spot. Now, one of the things I said is it's pretty easy to date because right here, there's the Peugeot building and there's the Frank Terra building and there's no hotel. Well, in 1910, it burned down. Okay, and so, so, that, so now we know that that other picture for two reasons, and you'll see another reason in a minute, but, uh, but for two reasons, we know that it's, that previous picture was after 1910, after the fire. So we're looking north in this particular scene. Now this is an earlier photograph from about the, uh, about the same place. And this photograph comes in the 1890s. And you notice there's a hotel and, that's what, uh, and that would have been Alfred French, but you'll notice it's structurally different. There's a porch at this, you know, at, there's a kind of a cover, if you will, a portico for the ground floor. There's, porch for the upper floor. That porch was not in the previous thing. So architecturally, this, this, we, there are a lot of reasons why we know this is in the 1890s. It also happened to be published in a, in a book in, in the 1890s. And that's where this picture came from, is from that book. So we can date it reasonably accurately. But the key is, is that uh, we kind of a continuity, but this, this, this was always a hotel from say the middle 1800s 
up until say the 1920s, which is when it transitioned to Fat Boy and then later transitioned again into an office building. This is on the southeast corner. Remember I said, remember in that earlier photograph, the kind of slightly, that's that slightly elevated street scene. Um, this roof line, this is what you'd see today. You go down to Main Street today, that's what you're gonna see. It's a wood chili restaurant now. Uh, this is basically, and okay, things to kind of help find where the changes are or where similarities are. That roof line, that whole, that particular roof line, you can kind of remember it and, and the struts that are supporting the roof, because that's gonna be key to identifying things from a time element point of view. There are these medallions that going along this, this um, those will be significant in terms of identifying changes that happen. Where you're really going to see changes is down here at this street level. Look at the windows, just kind of make a mental note of the windows and then watch what I'm going to do in the next picture. Same roof, same medallions. Uh, it's no longer it's no longer a restaurant. It's, it was a basically it was a, a, a saloon for a long time, had a long heritage as a saloon. Uh, but you'll notice the window treatment is completely different. And of course you get this also this iconic uh, wall feature here of the guy with a beer and, and so on, right? So this is definitely a place to come and drink uh, back, in, back in the days of 1970 and sliding backward in time toward World War II, okay? It was Smith Corners and you'll notice Again, same, same medallions, same roof structure, support structure, but even, even a lot more uh, window glass in those days than in uh, Campbell's Corners and hugely more glass than in today's Red Chili's restaurant. This is a kind of a pleasant street scene in Lopitas. And there's a vehicle over here. It looks like a truck that's parked and so on. Uh, actually, and this was built around uh, 1908. Uh, this particular structure was. Uh, the location's been occupied since the middle 1800s, but this, this particular structure is basically it's in the 1900s, early 1900s. Uh, there's a building right there which is, I'm gonna show you very soon, not quite, but very soon. And that's actually the Bank of Milpitas. Okay, so now I'm reminding you about the thing and you'll notice the, what, we're, what we're getting here. Again, I'm, just, I'm bringing this back in to view, which is, so here's the hotel that didn't have the second, the second level you know, porch, you know, that, that hung way out and so on with a railing around it and so on and so forth. So this is a way to, to resynchronize you to appearances. And, you know, here's this building again, and you see, and that's not the same architectural structure that we have um, with Smith's Corners and Campbell's Corners and Red Chili. And one of the things was there was, there was a major fire in Milpitas in 1910, and it just, and destroyed a, a bunch of things. And I think, I think that became a point at which um, new architectural styles emerged as the, as the buildings were basically rebuilt, but they weren't rebuilt as identical to what they had been. If you flip around from, from, from the, the uh, your building on the left, basically you know, Smith's Corners, if you flip them, so that's looking westward. If you turn, if you were to actually just, up, if you were standing there and turn around, what you'd see is this particular building. Now, what was at this location, this is interesting, this is a current picture again. Uh, and it used to be a, a sign store if you needed to go in and if you needed signs or banners or something printed, you know, large, large scale things that you might, um, you know, put up and things like that. That used to be the business that was in here at one point, but before that, it was basically Milpitas's second fire station. The first fire station 
which I didn't, I did not incorporate a picture of the first fire station because it's about a hundred yards away and it wasn't on Main Street. And so I thought it might be a little bit misleading, but the first fire station would have been to the left of the Milpitas Hotel on the Milpitas Elvisa Road. This is on Main Street, like I say, essentially looking quasi eastward, maybe in terms of pure direction here, we're looking maybe about southeast because uh, the, the hills are over to the left of us, if you will. But it's fire stations where you could go to vote and, and things like that. Um, so this was number number two, uh, right just about the time that the city was going to incorporate, which was 1954. Well, what would have been before that, uh, and there would have been some older buildings there that I don't have a good picture to show you. So there would have been some buildings that preceded that fire station. Um, but if you push past beyond that and get back to photographs that I have available to show you, one of the things that we had uh, basically just across the street and maybe just a, just a tad south of the saloons, Smith's Corners and so on, was a cannery. This was actually cannery number 21. And there, was, there were two canneries here. I'll show you another one in a second. This was, there was a crop, different crops were grown in Milpitas depending upon market conditions. And at this particular thing, what they're processing their peas as a matter of fact, in this upper picture, those are peas on those old uh, truck, well, the truck and the wagon that, that's being pulled by the truck. And they're gonna be processed by this cannery. This is actually our second cannery, the, the next cannery I'm gonna show you. And then actually the bottom picture give you an idea of staffing, right? So canneries uh, back in those days, if you weren't actually uh, picking in, in, at this time, you'd have, uh, you'd have earth orchards emerging and things like that as well as other crops like such as peas. If you weren't uh, one of the farmers and working on laboring on, as a worker on one of the farmers, you were probably being occupied uh, and only when it was seasonal, so it was seasonal work, your job was in terms of making uh, some money was maybe as a cannery worker and that's an example of, and, and when they were, and they would be very, very busy when it was, when it was basically canning time. This was, this was the first factory, factory 15, uh, different appearance, uh, you know, and actually just a different factory, but it was basically the same location. Um, and this was, this was Milpitas' first factory, at least that I know of, for canning. And the, this California Fruit Canners Association, what becomes interesting is, is that's a group of canners, canning businesses. Well, what, what's interesting about that is, is that if you think of Del Monte fruit, this is what we're talking about here. Del Monte would have been in one of this association and basically Del Monte became the, the, one of the dominant um, canning, canning businesses. Uh, I can still go to Safeway today and other stores and buy Del Monte products. Okay, well, so just to the south, of Smith's Corners, the saloon, the saloon corner, if you will. Just to the south is this building, it's there today. Uh, actually, it's a victim of the pandemic, if you will, but this building was built a while back. But right now, uh, at this moment in December, this is called the Best Sandwiches Cafe. The previous uh, business that was here was the Sea Link Cafe. And like I said, it ran about five years. It was a a, 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 uh, a victim of the change in business, particularly with restaurants or food places, uh, as a result of the, this, this year's pandemic. The person that was running uh, Sealink Cafe is actually pretty much running the business at the Best Sandwiches Cafe, but it's basically now a new owner. But so she's gotten uh, out from under the, the financial you know, catastrophe of the pandemic. But anyway, the key is it's what's significant is if you go right, the build, basically the building just to the south of the Red Chili restaurant is this building. But what used to be there was the Bank of America. And actually there's a photograph that I don't have, which is, this is Bank of America in 1937. Uh, the photograph, I, I would like to have a nice photograph and I'll, I'll I will find one. I, Usually, if I keep digging, and I usually wind up being able to fill in 
timelines in the archives and things like that. In 1955, um, this building was demolished by Bank of America and they put in a modern building to replace it. Uh, but so the question is, well, if they destroyed this building, what in about 18 years from this point, uh, what, what, what was the story behind this building? And the key to recognizing this building is again, looking at this roof structure and the details and so on, because what you're gonna see is in 1937, Bank of America occupied this building, but before that, it was Milpitas' first bank. It was the Bank of Milpitas, which was founded in 1912 by Edward Giacomazzi. And, and remember, we had a photograph. It was a postcard of the um, Peshot building. And then I had a postcard of Cannery 15, Factory 15. Those are postcards that are part of a series that um, Edward Giacomazzi created uh, to to, I guess, uh, create a record, if you will, uh, uh, of uh, Milpitas at, at that stage in time. And they were, they were actually printed by, well, well, let me see, the publisher, the publisher that was of those postcards was actually in San Francisco. What's in, kind of fascinating is the printer was actually in Germany. Um, and that same publisher, by the way, in that era did a lot of San Francisco postcards and a lot of those postcards were by that publisher were in point of fact printed in the same plants in Germany and things like that. But, but so this is basically Milpitas' early bank, 1912. Uh, Edward Giacomazzi is actually of Swiss descent. Um, you know, we have a lot of Portuguese descent, uh, Spanish, Mexican descent, and then of course a lot of the the Western European uh, after the gold rush, we started getting a lot of a lot of people from various European uh, extractions. By the way, the old Joe S steamer uh, sign there on the fence in front of the the, uh, the that that house and off to the left of the bank. What's kind of interesting is that's that was actually an ad, if you will, is that you know, the fence was a billboard. Old Joe's steamer was a beer that was actually made at one of the breweries in San Jose. You know? And something that I uh, uh, am not showing you is to the right of, so this is the bank and over to the right, there's a gap and over to the right is the saloon, right? Well, in this space that you're seeing like where the tree is here on the right, this, this zone here, this kind of gap, actually in the old, or in, in, in previously, uh, or actually after this photograph, the Smith houses, there were two houses built here, one behind the other, and Smith, like I say, ran the salon. So there was some Smith residences over here, uh, uh, you know, after this time. Uh, this is gonna be pretty interesting to, from a religious point of view. Again, modern picture, uh, St. John's School. If you look at where the location of the tree and maybe the parking lot, you can see the asphalt there. If you look at that zone right there, that's kind of important because that's the location where the St. John the Baptist Catholic Church um, used to be. And this is, you know, quite old today. This, the Saint, so this is Main Street again. Uh, here we're looking north up Main Street, you know, just loaded with carriages pictures roughly, and actually this would have been a, a Giacomazzi era postcard. Uh, um, and so the, the, the so but this, this particular church burned down uh, in 1901. So it was here in 1910. Uh, and, but, and so I'll show you that a little bit more about that in a minute. The rebuilt St. John the Baptist Catholic Church is now over on basically behind this, uh, behind this and maybe just a tad to the north, but this, this is this is St. John property. The, 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 uh, the, new, the new church is, is you know, certainly not in this architectural style and it's over on Abel and it's also on, on uh, church property. And actually this building today would be church property to this whole complex between Maine and Abel. This was, this was the original church. Uh, you can see there's a lot of reasons why this, I'll slip back. You can see trees, you know, so you can see 
time has passed where suddenly now you have trees that are grown up maybe 10, possibly 20 years old, depending upon the particular type of tree and its growth, you can actually see uh, one of the one of the planted trees right right here. Okay, it was just a sprig, but so this this picture would have been taken um, before. Uh, let me see this. Uh, yeah, okay, this church, but this what this particular one would be 1901, and right after after its reconstruction, if you will, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this is an important church, a uh, Catholic church. The, uh, there's a the, its cemetery is actually up on Piedmont Road. And people that have been Catholic and whose families have lived in Milpitas for a long time, they can be buried up there. That's the original church. That was the church that was built in 1872. And it was the church that was destroyed in 1901. So you can see again, there's a, I'll just briefly go back for you to give you another opportunity to look. So it's a bit more elaborate in style and in particular with the tower here for like ringing the bells probably. It was probably a bell tower there that, that would basically call to service if you will. Um, but, that's, but that was the first Catholic church. Now before the church was built, the, the what, uh, well, two things. Um, one was the first Catholic mass before that was built was actually on uh, John Sinnott's farm. And I mentioned John Sinnott briefly earlier at the beginning. And uh, I'll, I'll try to remember to bring him up again at a, at a photo later. I'm not, I'm not gonna spend any time on his particular farmhouse. It was off of uh, Main Street, Old Oakland Highway. But you know, I'm not so much focusing on the residences in this presentation. This would have been the place at which uh, prior to a church, Catholics could come to for confessions. And it was not in exactly the location of the first church, you know, in the 1870s, okay. Uh, but it was nearby, but this, this would have been where, like I say, a Catholic service of sorts, confessions and so on, could be administered. It's thought that it was probably along the banks of the Penitentia Creek, that's, that's kind of interesting from, an, from several points of view. Um, uh, I think I have some, I think I put in some aerial photographs, but it turns out Penitentia Creek, if you're unable and you're going along and you see the flood control canal, it's now all straightened and so on and so forth for flood control purposes. But that's actually, it used to be a meandering creek bed and, a, um, and on its way from the hills out toward the South Bay. And, uh, and the creek had the name Penitentia and this confessional building was thought to be uh, you know, near the banks of Penitentia Creek. Becomes an interesting thing, did they name Penitentia Creek because of the confessional or did the, which is probably the case because like I say, Penitentia, it makes sense that it would be thought of as a, as a, uh, as a confessional building. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're con confessing, you're taking penance. So that's probably where Penitentia Creek gets its name is from this particular early, early structure before the first Catholic church was built. So gorgeous picture, mostly because of the hills and the clouds and so on and so forth. But the reason why it's here is that we're further down on Main Street and we're at basically the Elmwood Correctional Facility, basically from the, from the Western side of it, looking to the East, obviously. Right. And well, why did I want to bring that up? But it's called significantly Elmwood Correction Facility. Okay. Now, if you were on Main Street, you can stop on Main Street. That's before you get to Curtis, before you get to what is referred to in the modern fire station numbering. Fire station one is down on Curtis, which is clo very close to the Great Mall and the Home Depot. And it's also the fire department's administration building. So if you come a little bit north of there, there's this sign. It's partially hidden by this bush, but I wanted this particular angle. This is the O'Toole Elmwood Park. Okay. And you can see these trees lining this. Well, actually, this used to be a lane. The main street is basically where I'm standing and looking to the basically looking um, southwest. 
So in, with ang it was angling about 45 degrees off of Main Street. There was this angling, angling lane road. It was lined with elms. The old, old elms are, are you know, they became diseased and had to be torn out, which is a shame because they were, they were, they were very old. They go way back into the 1800s. Uh, they're, they're, yeah, it, um, the exact date of planting, I wouldn't know, but I, I know that that uh, they, they would have been there for actually quite a while, but they were they were planted just specifically to line the lane leading to this mansion, John O'Toole. And actually the O'Tooles, they were, two, they were brothers and from basically from, uh, basically well, if you think about where Main Street connects to uh, say Capitol, if you look at that point as a Southern perimeter, if you will, and work your way all the way North up to um, today's Sarah Way and the old days, the Alviso Milpitas Road, that was O'Toole property, gener generally speaking. And in 1876, that was O'Toole property. And then you would have started these transitions where suddenly you know, you, the church starts to appear and things like that. Well, what's intriguing about the O'Toole mansion is, so this was privately held. As a matter of fact, uh, when that was sold, the, the person who bought it was Boyd, Dr. Boyd, the one who founded the veterinary clinic that I showed you previously, uh, he wound up flipping this thing. And I mean, he, had, he, he owned it for practically no time at all. And what I mean by flipping it is, is that he, he paid a low price for the property, the mansion and the property and so on, because it was basically a farm. And, um, and he turned around and sold it to the Santa Clara County and Santa Clara County turned it into an almshouse, which is to say a house for the poor. He had a huge profit. It was kind of a, the scandal of the of the of the moment that the that the county paid so much more than than he had just shortly beforehand had had purchased it. Because uh, I think if I remember, he sold it to the county for twenty five thousand dollars, which was actually at that time quite a bit of money, and way above what he had paid for it. Uh, what's a kind of there's a, the interesting backstory to this is is that this. This at one point was pretty well filled with uh, poor people, but as that as it became less and less occupied with poor people, the county started putting honor prison prisoners. In other words, people who were in jail, but they were not regarded as violent criminals and things like that. And again, this was a farm. This was a this was basically a farm location, if you will. And so they would put these honor prisoners in there. And okay. It's actually why Elmwood Jail, because again, Elmwood Lane is what leads up to this property. The Elmwood Correctional Facility is just directly tied to this. And basically today's correctional facility, if you will, with some gaps in time, went from an early, an early correctional facility after it had been used as a private housing, and then had been used as poor housing, and then finally had become some correctional uses. And uh, now today, you've got this huge complex of the Elmwood uh, Correctional Facility. So we're getting toward the end of my talk and a little bit more to go. Um, this is actually shot from the garage at the Great Mall. Um, railroads are really important. I can't, I, it, I can spend a lot of time talking about the importance to, of railroads to Milpitas, but the key is, is that today we have Union Pacific operating this line, and it's a freight line, not a passenger line. And, and, and actually just to the right of it, right over here, so this rail line is, you know, the Union Pacific you know, freight line. The, BART is running parallel, and it's, you know, and BART is, you know, basically going to be really firing up full scale here and then and as uh, coming from all the way up in the North Bay down eventually to uh, into San Jose downtown area. But the, basically this is the BART thing and the BART terminal is over there on uh, Capitol. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Landes. But this huge array of lines that you see here, this was the expansion of what was a very simple rail structure in the 1870s. This was the expansion of the rail structure that was necessary to support Ford. 
what they would do is they would have uh, when when this thing would be in in in, in its days of massive production, um, the these various spurs that we'd see here they'd be filled with, for example, auto auto carriers, uh, basically cars specifically designed to haul automobiles, and it, these would be designed to be going to it would be assembling trains to be going to different locations once they'd been filled and they'd hook the locomotives up to them and and they'd make their run to one destination or another so they needed they needed to be able to have an elaborate loading facility and that's what this really kind of represents here is to show how much uh, development took place because this is what we used to have just uh, six years earlier if you will uh, it was a simple, simple rail line. This is a 1949 photograph. It first of all illustrates two things. One is you can see if you look above, I mean, we have cattle pens here along the rail line and, and we have this massive, again, agricultural um, economy, if you will, at that point, because this is pre-Ford, pre-manufacturing era. And we're still ranching and farming, if you will. Uh, so it's 1940. 1949. This is this is kind of a celebratory, you know, a real hoot of um, in railroad history. What they did is they took an 1869 era locomotive, and which was when the transcontinental railroad was was created, which dramatically changed the West in terms of how quickly. Prior to that, you would either have to go overland by wagon or to go by sea, either around <coughs> the tip of South America, but what was more likely is you were going to go to Panama and then trek your way across the Panama Isthmus and climb on a different ship to come up to San Francisco. So, so once railroads came in, dramatic revolution in basically tying the West to the East. But so this, this train is like, it's an 80th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad that they had done and to, to kind of uh, give a sense of what it would have been like in the 18, 1869, 1870 period. So this is, like I said, a special celebration appearance in Milpitas in 18, 1949. So, okay, reminder, okay. So then Ford came in, okay, and we started this transition into an industrial economy. You know, I said I was gonna mention John Sinnott. This is John Sinnott's property. I mean, it used to be before the Ford plant was here, uh, there used to be this lane that came down to Main Street that went to his, to his farm. And he's the one that came with the, uh, the migrated out of Ireland with the Murphys. There's a, there's a big history behind that, that if, if I do some other presentations, I'd like to do some other presentations on some of the key people that came into Milpitas at different points in time. And John Sinnott would be one of them. And one of the things that's interesting about him, he's Catholic. Murphy's are Catholic. They came out of Ireland, right? They first went to Quebec, Canada. Well, they came here. Why? They actually, they came to California at the time because California was Spanish, okay? Well, actually, it was Spanish for the Murphys. Uh, John Sinnott came right after the gold rush. So at that point, it would have been United States territory. But he was Catholic and very devout, and so were the Murphys. Uh, but the first mass um, before St. John the Baptist Church was built was at John Sinnott's place. So for people, for Catholics, that would be a significant historical point. Uh, Ford built a lot of cars here. I mean, it got to the point where they could crank out a car and very, very rapidly because this is a big facility you know, the, where they had been manufacturing before, before World War II. Um, they had outgrown it. That's why they came down here and built a much larger plant and they could, they could build a lot of cars and they were employing about 5,000 people in the 1950s, which is pretty amazing considering that you know, it, was, it was only briefly before that the Milpitas had a population of 500. Uh, these are actually Shelby, Shelby Mustangs that are being built here. But to, to be more accurate, what they would do is they would they would build a car with the correct body styles for Shelby. But it, when you wanted a truly authentic Shelby Mustang, 
what they would do is they would load these, these cars, any of these cars that had been contracted, they would load them onto an auto carrier, a train, and they would take them to Southern California for Shelby to, to do all of his conversion. And then they would be certified. They would really be truly certified as uh, not only a, a, you know, a Shelby Mustang, but they would actually carry his certification too with all of his engine modifications and suspension modifications that he would make to them. But Ford would basically build the, the, the basic original car and then ship them off. Well, one of the things that we used to do once we started this industrial area is we started to lose connection to what what it was like in the agricultural period. And so the, the some of the businessmen in Milpitas basically started something called Frontiers Day, which was a, a very festive thing. It was a four to five day affair. You can see that in the in this particular poster on the left here, just above the dates. So this, this particular poster is 1972. It was a five day festival. Um, back in the, they'd have a carnival. So they'd, have, they'd have a carnival. That, that's Mayor Ben Gross. The, the young lady who's on the left is uh, Kathy Cardoza. Her father ran a store. It was the Red and White Market on Main Street. Um, and she was an avid horse rider and she became the in 1967, the queen for the Grand National, uh, quarter horse queen, and the, the young lady on the right, uh, Sylvia Tesse, she was uh, the Indian princess, Bay Area Indian princess. They were both, I think, juniors, if I remember, in 1967 in Ayer High School. That was Ben Gross, by the way. He was mayor at the time in 1967. So here you can get the sense of the carnival, the extent of the carnival activity. And by the way, in, in these particular photos, the location is, uh, there's, there's a, there was a strip, of, in those days, there was a strip of dirt land between Main Street and Abel. It was just all dirt from, uh, got all the way from Capitol, all the way down to, I, I don't even think the post office in the early days was there in that location, because it was still over on today's Carlos, Carlos Street or the old uh, Calaveras Road. Uh, but uh, but it was all dirt. It's a big dirt lot, and this is you know just basically just on the west side of the Ford plant, if you will. Okay, on the west side of Main Street, and so that's for for quite a while. That's that's not the only place, but that's definitely one of the places in, in the history of the frontier days where the festival was held. This was a parade activity, by the way. There's a kind of interesting uh, a peak in history that roof structure, that striped roof structure, that's A&W root beer. So we're basically on Main Street. And in those days, uh, these, yeah, this would have been before the overpass. So this would have been Calaveras Road going off to the left and angling toward the hills. And uh, this would have been the gas station. Whoop, hang on a second. Get my thing. This would have been the gas station that replaced that that previous uh, one that I showed earlier in my presentation, the Spangler Rose, that's the, Sp that's the location of the Spangler Rose uh, gas station. But now, now it's a different structure. Uh, Milpitas, there's a Ford, there was a Ford Club, a Milpitas Ford Club, you know, so guys would, you know, get old cars and so on and drive them in parades and so on. Before that, we had the stagecoach. Uh, the, this individual here, that's Benny Weisgerber. Recently, he passed away, but he was, uh, I don't remember exactly, Bill, but he's 90-ish anyway. And he was very, he was former mayor of Milpitas in some, in some of its earlier history and so on. This is Ben Gross. He was a, he would have been a mayor probably at the time of this particular photograph and so on. But Wells Fargo in those days as a promotional thing, as a promotional event, they would go around to various festivals, you know, like a 4th of July or, or whatever, and have horse-drawn stagecoaches. By the way, before we had bus lines uh, running on the uh, old Oakland Highway, we had stage lines, you know, literally we had stages in the 1800s. Well, so the ranchers would come down to these festivals on their horses with pretty much, uh, you know, special, you know, special uh, harnesses and so on for their horses. And actually what's in the background there is that's the old grammar school. So, um, you know, 
that's uh, give you a sense of where they were staging themselves. And one of the things, one of the relics that came out of uh, the frontier days is in the, the photograph after this will be interesting. The Milpitas Historical Society owns this frontier jail. We didn't build it. Uh, it was built originally as a kind of a parade vehicle. And I'll explain more about that in a second uh, for the Frontier Day Festival and so on. Now we, we take it to public events when, you know, up until the pandemic came on us, the last time that we had this one out, we had decorated it up with, we were in a uh, park, it was Cardoza Park, as a matter of fact, uh, named, you know, for Kathy Cardoza's father, the, the uh, quarter horse queen. Um, <clears throat> so we will take it out to festivals and, and especially children in particular like to go inside and have their parents take pictures of them. So, and we kind of gave it a Halloween look um, at the same time by putting cobwebs up and a tape that says, you know, zombie crossing and, and so on. And it was decorated inside as well as outside. So we have a lot of fun with this particular thing. But this is, this is an older photograph. Uh, this would have been in 19, let me see, 1967. Uh, this was the sixth, the sixth year of the Frontier Day Festival, and that's Kathy Cardozo in the center. And what's kind of interesting about it, you see the seven sheriffs here. Uh, what's going to be really interesting is what I tell you what the point of this was. They, they, they used to want to have to make this very uh, fun kind of affair, frivolous and even prank-ish. And these seven deputies, when they would, when they would um, take, when they would um, tow this down Main Street in a parade and things like that. If men along on the side, they didn't do it to women and children, but if men were, uh, were clean shaven, they didn't have a mustache or a beard, they'd arrest them. You know, it's a kind of, it's, again, it's not an honest arrest. It's not, a, it was not a, a legal action. It was a, it was a playful prank thing. And they would arrest them and the, the, um, the prisoner would have to like pay a buck to get released from jail. But there were the, they had a lot of fun doing that. What I find fascinating was six out of the seven uh, guys here are clean faced. So it's like they needed to arrest themselves. So winding up. So just a few, few more slides, few more remarks, because one of the things that I'm often presented with is the question, what's the meaning of the word Milpitas? And there is a conventional or a more popularly accepted one. And one of the things that you can do on your own, I'm not gonna run the video here because I don't wanna take the time to do that because you can easily access it yourself. If you go to YouTube, uh, there's, there's basically two opinions. The one that's the most commonly accepted is the one that Steve Munzel will describe you know, for you. Um, which is that the translation is from an, a um, Central American Indian language, Nahuatl. But it translates out of small gardens or little cornfields. And one of the books that, that, you know, that people can buy about Milpitas is called Little, little Cornfields. Uh, but if you were to go to, uh, to YouTube and do a search on Milpitas history, Steve Munzel, and if you look for a picture similar to this, you look for Steve in the center there, that's Debbie Giordano on the left and Todd Fleshner on the right. Um, but if you if you do that search, you'll get you can find you know I'm per, I'm showing the the URL up there, but you know that's really kind of awkward to to type in and so on. But but you can find this and and listen to Steve's they're interviewing Steve and he's explaining um, what he believes and what is basically the most popularly accepted notion of what Milpitas is. If you go to the city website, it'll say Little Cornfields. The Historical Society has tended to, to, um, to be the advocate for Milpitas means Little Cornfields. But Craig Bunnell, who is also a, has, was a longtime member of the Historical Society, he moved about a year and a half ago to Florida. Um, if you do a Google search or YouTube search, for Milpitas history, Craig Bunnell, and look for a photograph where you can see Craig in it. Okay, I, I provide the, the URL, but like I say, that's kind of awkward to, for you to type. Um, you can find this and listen to his thing. And he's, he's, he's basically uh, advocating the notion that um, Milpitas is a direct 
translation from Spanish. Mil translates as thousand and pita is agave. And so what the, the, in both cases, by the way, both assertions in terms of the translation, they are suggesting that the name of Milpitas comes from some kind of natural feature. I'll back up, right? So it, there, there resided some prominent number of cornfields or garden areas, for example, that was encouraging the notion of um, this, the, this word of Milpitas, which was presumably of Indian, Indian origin, uh, Central American origin. Or in Craig's case, he's advocating the Spanish, that it's a Spanish translation meaning a thousand agaves. Anyway, that'll give you some own background and I'll let them explain um, why they believe or what they do believe as to what the meaning of Milpitas is. And this is our website. This is basically, we're basically about at the end now. This is our website that you can go to. You can see the website address. Bill mentioned at the beginning, it's Milpitas Historical Society with no spaces. MilpitasHistoricalSociety.org, they're at the top. Uh, this article that's showing here. This is a major article that I, I uh, wrote this um, recently. It was published in the Milpitas Beat in November. I put it up on the website here in December. Uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, an extensive history, both of um, Jose Maria de Jesus Alpiso, uh, who was the person who um, was granted Rancho Milpitas, the land, you know, 40, 40, 4,400 acres and just rough numbers. But if you were to go to our website, one of the things that you can do is you can read, Bill's mentioned this. Uh, I plan to expand, I've been doing a lot of research and I, I plan to expand the content of the website significantly. And the way in which I'm gonna expand it is in articles that don't appear or actually in articles that provide re replacement articles, articles that actually give much more information than some of the the information that we have out there now. And that's basically my presentation. Um, 